described, uh, open source has really created and sparked a global community of innovators. It's revved up that pace of technology and innovation. And so part of what we're going to do today is take a look back at some of the great successes of open source and how exactly those successes have set the stage for the next challenges and the next breakthroughs in open source. But since this is women tech, I wanted to start with giving you a little bit of background on how I got here, why I am so passionate about this subject. So I've been a math and science nerd as far back as I can remember. In my early years of trying to be an adult, I moved from biology to chemistry to physics. It wasn't really out of indecision. It was I was always looking for the hardest problems, the most interesting work. And I was always open to kind of new opportunities, even if they seemed to come from sideways directions. After a few decades in semiconductor research and AI, they really provided kind of an endless bounty of hard and interesting work. Kind of along that path, I had personal and professional highlights and lowlights. My overseas work uh, as an expat assignment led to meeting my husband and starting a family. On the surface, you may look at this and say, gosh, the, there's no obvious reason that this would lead me to be working on open source. It seems like I had a chaotic career path. It may look completely random. But in fact, there's some secret patterns to this madness uh, that makes it almost inevitable that I am doing exactly the job that I'm doing today and helping to bring this forward. So if I look a little bit closer on this time, I was working in semiconductor R&D, two decades of it, different companies, different countries, working in researcher roles, director roles, working on transistors to wiring to circuit design. Um, many different things across that process. But, you know, it's not the career progression that's actually the interesting part that helps you to understand why I'm here. Uh, there are two things in particular I want to call out. One is across all of those jobs, uh, what was incredibly important is partnerships. The other piece is how open source came to play. So on the topic of partnerships at every step of my career, the biggest technical breakthroughs, the most magical inventions came with a kind of almost alchemy when diverse and complex partnerships are built and nurtured to solve problems. But community collaboration is not always easy and there's a skill to develop and so that you can foster constructive and creative communities. That would be an important skill that would help me in the world of open source. Uh, next up, in terms of that career path is about open source. So during that, those last two decades, many of the companies I worked for and partnered with, they had a strong historical, almost a fervor around creating and monetizing closed source IP. It's kind of a natural uh, instinct. You have a great breakthrough, an invention, you protect it, you try to monetize it and make a lot of money. Um, the idea of uh, open source is not always the first instinct in these companies. But over those two decades, I saw company after company move from that closed source IP protection mode to start to embrace the power of open source software as the central part of their products. I saw those companies transform both in the speed of their innovation, but also the quality of software produced when a community is involved in the creation, the testing, and the fixing of the software. So now you see some of the ingredients that got me here. Let me tell you a little bit about my current home, Canonical. It's the real epicenter of open source software work, but maybe you've never even heard of it. So Canonical has about a thousand employees in 70 countries. It's remote first from the beginning. And our mission is to deliver, maintain, secure, sustain open source software from cloud to desktop and devices. But we're most famous for being the publisher of Ubuntu. Well, maybe you're asking, what is Ubuntu? Uh, it is the most popular Linux distribution. But if you don't know what a Linux distribution is, that probably is meaningless to you. It is an operating system at its base. Think of Windows or Chrome or Android. Um, Ubuntu powers everything from small IoT devices to robots to servers in giant cloud computing estates. Uh, it's actually powering the laptop I'm using right now to present this presentation. If you look at the picture there, it, the wallpaper on that laptop is 
our latest release of Ubuntu called Lunar Lobster, and you won't get great release names like that from other operating systems, in my opinion. So where do I fit in in Canonical? Having come from this background of semiconductor research, it may seem strange to you at a software company. So at the work of my team in Canonical is to make sure that the best open source software just works with any hardware. And that starts with the chips that are used in servers, laptops, robots, coffee makers. Uh, these chips can have wildly different architectures, x86, ARM, RISC-V, they can be microprocessors, GPUs, SmartNICs, encryption chips, or any new uh, startup chip flavor of the day that comes out. We partner with chip makers to anticipate those future chipsets and features so that the open source software will just work when the hardware is launched. So now you get an idea of you know, what I'm doing, why it makes sense that I'm at a company like Canonical. Maybe the next question you're still asking is kind of what is open source software and what, why should I even care? So open source software kind of at its root principles is, is about free distribution of software. It's about access to source code and to ensure that no discrimination is involved in the distribution of that software. All great principles, right? And this creates a community of creators and users where everyone can use that software and benefit from it. Everyone can contribute and pr provide bug reports when there are issues with it. And it can be for anyone anywhere on the planet. And so open source uh, is so heavily used. GitHub has 100 million developer user accounts, 372 million repositories, but maybe 80% of those projects fail. So I wanted to talk a little bit about open source projects that work really well. So Linux, like Ubuntu, is a great example of it. Another is to look at AI, and AI has been multifaceted in terms of open source. So in terms of open source uh, projects across AI, you can think of it starting with some of the data science programming languages like Python, uh, moving into libraries and tools. Scikit-learn has been so central to this progress. One of my favorites is, is just about standardizing data sets so people can all develop models on this and benchmark on the same types of uh, data sets, uh, frameworks. This has really exploded things like TensorFlow and PyTorch and many that have come and gone in the, in the last decade. The models themselves uh, get used and built upon from previous work. And lots of uh, foundations helping to support researchers, helping to support industries, set standards and benchmarks. And so all of this great open source work, if we look kind of over time what's been going on, um, for a while the AI breakthroughs seemed sparse. They were about computers winning increasingly complex games. Uh, and while that was going on in parallel, you would see those open source projects that I was just talking about starting to make progress. You would see some foundational papers from like Hinton, Bengio, Lacoon on neural networks. Uh, you'd start to see GitHub really taking shape as a, as a community repository for open source. And something interesting happened when a bunch of uh, Stanford professors noted that they could use graphics cards kind of intended for gaming and they would be so perfectly tailored for the parallel processing needs of matrix multiplication, which is at the heart of deep learning training uh, that's needed for all these models. But all of these ingredients kind of combined together somewhere around 2015, in my perspective, is when it really started to explode and get kind of nuts, where AI innovation moved from the domain of the few to kind of the global masses. And so now we see AI discoveries, landmark inventions, seems like every day there's a new one. Uh, so some of them admittedly are more brilliant than others. Um, so if we look at kind of what are the common features to make a successful open source project, uh, passion, community interest, all of these are important and they can create great apps or packages or libraries or models, but actually building that app or that package is actually the easy part. 
you may be asking your question, how could that possibly be the easy part to, to create all of these new capabilities? So, so let me start with an example. Everybody loves apps for editing and manipulating digital images. Everybody loves when those apps are based on open source software and they can be available for free. Uh, here, here's a picture of my dog pretending to be low maintenance and pretending to be a good boy, which happens sometimes. Um, we think of like a photo editing tool as a single app. And if we want to commercialize, it's just one code repo to patch and update if there are bugs, right? But an app like this, born in open source, may be built on top of other open source packages, which were built with pre-existing packages. In the end, that one fun, cool app has a dependency tree touching hundreds of packages. To keep that app working, we need to maintain this complex web of versions. We need to find a way to address bugs and security vulnerabilities at every step of that tree. If a new app is born today, by tomorrow there will already be multiple security vulnerabilities found and could impact some component in the dependency tree. So building on pre-existing packages, it's part of what drives the speed of innovation in open source, but it is also at the root of why it is so challenging to secure and maintain open source for the long term. These complex dependencies that are endemic for open source create the challenge to provide long-term security and support for commercial deployments. Building the app is the easy part. Maintaining and securing is like the Mount Everest of open source challenges. So what's the next breakthrough in open source? I think you know already, right? The next breakthrough is solving that challenge to provide long-term security for open source software. So if you've created a great app every day, you're gonna figure out how to address those security vulnerabilities without breaking the app. To secure an application and deployment, you need to ensure that security across all of those dependencies. And so thanks to open source, we have a large and vibrant community creating great software, a great victory in democratization of technology. However, that burden of security support is a way that could uh, contract the size of that community. So securing it is the next is the big challenge and the next breakthrough we need. How we address that challenge will determine whether the proliferation of open source software innovation will be a commercial victory for the many or for the few. At Canonical, we're doing our part to deliver that easy button with Ubuntu Pro. We are approaching this technology by providing a commitment to long-term security patching on tens of thousands of the most popular open source packages. But this is not a commercial to get your money. This is to tell you about Ubuntu Pro. We're doing this for the community. This also has free subscription for your personal use and even for limited commercial use. And that's for everyone. This is not promotional offer. We're not asking for your credit card. This is an investment to strengthen the technology to make sure all of that growth and vibrancy that we've created in open source development does not get artificially contracted by that unbelievable challenge of security maintenance over the long term. So commercial interest is in fact an essential contribution to a successful open source project. Taking on the security updates for those complex dependency trees and by providing the long-term commitments needed to build commercial products. So open source, we've talked about today, it's a place where everybody can contribute, where everybody can benefit anywhere on the planet. And just to uh, get ready to close, I wanted to share with you that Canonical is hiring everywhere for everything at, in almost every single role in every part of the planet. So the next next breakthrough in open source just might be you. I invite you all to join us. Uh, the QR code is here. Uh, take a look. There are positions across the company. Personally, I have um, multiple roles just in my team. And this is not just software development. This is also sales, marketing, HR, product managers, every possible role you can imagine. And if you'd like to learn a little bit more about Canonical, please visit our booth 
or our team will be hosting a meet and greet on Wednesday. Miona, Varshi, Lydia, and Andrea, they come with from different corners of the business and different corners of the planet. You can ask them about business or products, our open positions, or their favorite sprint locations. I've been in company sprints in Cape Town, Copenhagen, Prague, and Montreal just in the last year. Come and join us for the next one. And in the spirit of community projects, my colleagues have been generous with their upstreaming contributions to this presentation and scanning for bugs. And I thank you for your time today. I look forward to your questions and finding ways that we can uh, talk more also in our meet and greet session. But I think, Anna, there's some uh, questions that have been submitted. Yeah, indeed. Thank you so much for your presentation. I really love the ending <laughs> of it and gradually moving to the questions. Yeah, we have some questions. We have three minutes and we'll take some of them and, and then participants will be able to follow up with you on LinkedIn or during the meet and greet sessions that you just announced. And let's take some of them. How can individuals and organizations get involved in open source projects? Oh, sure. Um, there are so many. I would first look at kind of areas where you're most interested in. Um, if you look on, on GitHub and, as an example, you can find communities around anything you're working on, be it uh, AI, be it AI for vision, AI for speech recognition, uh, creating chatbots. Um, if you're interested in open source for uh, data science, you can find your community for that. So I would first say kind of have a aim about what is the area you're looking to focus on and there should be no shortage of opportunities to join. Thank you. What issues do you think can, could arise from the accessibility of open source? Well, there's, uh, I tried to go through today kind of, you know, the challenge I'm most focused on this day, which is um, creating that kind of uh, long-term security support model. It is one of the um, interesting things. One of the, the things that's been fascinating for me to see is how um, open source technologies are getting closer to these very highly regulated industries where compliance requirements are quite stringent. So if you think about kind of that dependency tree I was showing you, where anybody in the world can contribute, you can have a ridiculous number of lines of codes contributed by people who may have had no idea that the intent, the result would be an application like this. And figuring out how you can provide the type of insurances and commitments for the highly regulated industries, that has been fascinating to see that uh, with things like FIP certification for government projects, moving forward uh, in the automotive industry is another one. I think that's been uh, a huge challenge historically, but they're starting to figure out and make massive progress in terms of marrying kind of a compliance structure that was set up for closed source software with what is really blossomed in terms of the future of software development. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Just on time, perfect timing. I see some questions about hiring engineers. I recommend oh, to join the meet and greet session. Drop us a note in the chat if you cannot find it. Thank you so much, Cindy, and we'll see you at the meet and greet and we'll reach out in case we have questions. I see some more questions, but running out of time. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very Anna. much.